Okay. Um, good evening. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, I'd like to call the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals meeting of Wednesday, January 2nd, 2013 to order. I'm going to apologize up front. We have a slight cold, so I'll be sniffling and coughing my way through the meeting. Uh, I guess the first uh, item on the agenda is to uh, approve the uh, meeting minutes from the October 23rd, 2012 meeting. Um, these were, as you may recall, uh, redlined after uh, Chris had put uh, computer to paper. And uh, I think at this point, everybody's hopefully had a chance to look at them. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to make a motion concerning the October 23rd me uh, minute meeting, meeting minutes. Any comments? No? I have a second then for the motion? Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Okay, I think that's five zero six zero. I missed who made the motion, I'm sorry. Uh, I made the motion. Okay. Seven zero did we have seven? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Have you met Matt Caden? I have not met <laughs> seven. <laughs> Hi Matt. <laughs> you could stay no, I won't even I won't go down that road. <laughs> you want me to introduce him? Yes, would you? Well we're very pleased the every every year the town council <laughs> Just through the process of uh, nominating uh, new members for the different boards and commissions, and Matt stepped forward to uh, Matt or Matthew uh, step forward to uh, step forward to serve on the zoning board. Uh, like some of you, he's an attorney. Uh, no big surprise there, and uh, he has overseas experience in the United Kingdom, That's right. uh, as well as uh, here locally. So I think he'll be a fine addition to the planning board. Dave Johnson uh, served six years and. Uh, completed, you know, two, two full terms on the zoning board. So, welcome. And uh, while I'm speaking, I also did want to confirm that uh, the council approved this evening uh, the appointment of Ben McDougall as the new code enforcement officer. Uh, ben is currently the code enforcement officer for the town of York. Uh, he's also the Shoreland Zoning Administrator. Uh, before that, worked for a company called Sweet Associates. Uh, representing uh, individuals before boards, such as yourself, on wetland issues, uh, other environmental permitting. So Ben's a resident of Scarborough. He'll be starting on uh, Jul uh, J January 22nd. So uh, the next time the zoning board meets, uh, he'll be your staff person. So I, I think you'll enjoy working with him. And uh, I think he's going to be a great code officer. So. Great. It's great news. Thank you. OK. Um, Moving right along to the minutes of the November 27, 2012 ZBA meeting. Uh, I have one correction, which is uh, in the beginning of paragraph B, where it says a motion to table the approval of the minutes was made by Mr. Johnson. I don't think he was here for that meeting. I'm pretty sure I made that motion. So uh, it should be Thibodeau instead of Johnson. Uh, apart from that, I didn't see anything too material. Anyone? Any? No. Anyone want to make a motion to approve the minutes? Sure. So move. <laughs> You're going to force me to read lips, aren't you? <laughs> I'd have a second. All in favor of approval of the minutes of uh, November 27, 2012? Any opposed? Seven zip. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess we uh, need to, uh, I think everybody had in their packets a, uh, which I think might be the first time I've even seen them, but the uh, review of the Zoning Board of Appeals rules and regulations. Um, but 
uh, and what can contain within there is the need to uh, elect, uh, which occurs January of each year, uh, a new chairman and uh, a secretary of the ZBA. Uh, do not let the title in front of my name confuse anyone. I'm here because I don't know how I got, got in front of this microphone, but in any event, um, it's time for a new chairman. <laughs> Uh, do I have any, uh, anyone want to float? You've been on the board a good amount of time, right? Yes, I have, Chris. Where are you going with this? Have you served as the chairman before? No. I actually, yes, last, last, uh, last, <laughs> meeting, last <laughs> meeting. I thought I'm sitting in between the conversation. <laughs> I'd make a motion to nominate Mr. Thibodeau as the chair of the board, unless Mr. Thibodeau is uh, greatly opposed to the motion. I'm not greatly opposed, just generally opposed. But I will. I, I'm sorry. Oh, that's great. Out of left field. Okay. <laughs> I would be happy to serve as chair, as long as you can put up with my stumbling and bumbling for 12 months. You guys, second, maybe. I'll second the motion then. Okay. Just uh, all in favor? Aye. Any, any opposed? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, abs I'll abstain just because it's your vote, and I want to vote myself. Um, and then we also need a board secretary. Uh, go ahead, make the motion. Chris. Chris. Chris is a good secretary. Second. All in favor? Opposed? At 7 0. That was a slam dunk. Okay. All right. Well, congratulations, Chris. He's the new secretary, and I guess I'm the chairman. How did this happen? Okay. Um, and I, I, I'll assume everybody had a chance to look at the rules and regulations over the, the ZBA. I don't know if there's any, I'm not going to take the time to read through them unless there was anything that was earth shattering or, or new. Okay. Uh, okay, the other thing we had uh, in our packet was it was a letter that uh, um, we were asked to review on a kind of a communication uh, from us to the town council around the, the whole administrative appeal and the Noticing of, of building permits. I um, did everyone have a chance to take a look at that. Oops, excuse me. Okay. Any feedback on that or questions? I mean, I thought it was well written. I think it addresses. I think some of our some of the things we've articulated up here as far as providing notices to the citizens so they have time to you know, raise their hand and do the research and you know, get in front of uh, our board if if need be. Okay. So if there's no uh, if there's no comments, then I will uh, I will go ahead and sign the letter. I guess as chairman of the of the ZBA on behalf of, of the board. Can I just add one thing, possibly uh, to think about and discuss to show some kind of proof that there was a notice to neighbors, maybe some sort of certified uh, letter should be sent out by the applicant to abut us within a certain range. You know, maybe within a mile or whatever, which can be determined by the uh, assessor's office. They give them a list, give that person a list, and then when they appear for the hearing, that they show the cards where they uh, did notify. Well, uh, the, uh, I said an ad has to appear. Do ads appear? Well, they do. Okay, so your copy of the ad. No, no not for a building permit. No. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm thinking of some way that that, that they prove that they did notify neighbors. One of the things that I liked about the way the letter was written was that it left it to the discretion of the committee that is drafting the ordinance to specify how to provide that notice. We didn't really say, here's how you should do it. We just said, look, we the ZBA have had a lot of these appeals recently where people haven't realized that this work was being done and can you put some language in the ordinance that requires that addresses that situation so that people do have actual notice before the 30-day appeal period has run and either change the appeal period 
or change the notice requirements however you the committee want to do that that's within your discretion but can you please address the situation and I, I agree I, um, and I'd note I think the meetings in two days and unless the town attorney indicates otherwise because it doesn't directly impact an issue for us I assume any one of us can show up as a member of the public and offer comments and feedback as to what we think would be a good way to provide that notice if I might, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Strauss is correct. The Ordinance Committee is meeting at 8 a.m. on Friday to discuss that. And I think it will be the kickoff discussion, but public comments welcome at that meeting. And they're not going to come to any conclusions, I don't think, on Friday. But it's going to be the beginning of a discussion process. But if anyone wishes to provide input, it would be greatly appreciated. Okay. <coughs> any, anybody else? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, I think that includes all of our uh, <clears throat> administrative uh, items. Uh, there's no old business that I can think of for once or see. Uh, the, uh, the variance request of uh, 195 Fowler Road has been withdrawn from the agenda, so we, we yeah, that was the first one on the agenda, so we can scratch that off the list and that would bring us to uh, uh, then the another variance request um, um, of uh, variance of map u03 uh, lot 114 at 825 Shore Road for Maria S Chambers to construct a garage with a rear setback of six feet, a side setback of four feet, and a setback of 16 feet from Stony Brook Road. Uh, Ms. Chambers here. Would you like to come up to the podium and fill us in? Thank you. Okay. Before we get started, I, I live on Stony Brook Road. I just wanted to put that out there to the board. I'm not in a butter um, to the property at issue. I live kind of farther down Stony Brook. Um, I don't think this creates any, any conflict, and I think it would certainly be impartial on this, but I just wanted to uh, let the board know that I am I do live on Stony Brook. Okay. If I might, just one, I know there's pictures circulating. Are you submitting those for the record? Because we can't, if you submit them and they're part of the meeting, we really can't give them back to you unless we. Oh yeah, we don't need copies. Them back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Have Adam. I All just right. didn't want you to. No, no, think no. We were stealing your pictures. <laughs> All right. So, just to to explain. So I live at 825 Shore Road, the short corner of Shore and Stony Brook. It's a rather long and narrow lot. There are actually three lots that are fairly close together. 820. Uh, one, 823, and 825. 821 and 823 both have existing garages in the back corner of their lots. I do not have a garage, and so I'm here asking for a variance to build a garage. And what we are proposing, if, if you take a look at the photos that I just passed around, the problem that I'm trying to solve is I don't have a garage. There is no place to put my things. So. Um, I'm proposing to build a, a garage in the back right corner of the lot. If you look at the, uh, the map, I put on here, again, the, the two other lots that um, are adjoining to me, 821 and 823, have their original garages that are in the back right corners. And I'm proposing <coughs> building my garage directly across the line with the same setbacks. So it would be back in the corner as well. So it, it would be very um, much like what my neighbors have. If I were to build it within the restrictions, it would be sort of in the middle of the backyard and towards the street. So it would actually considerably uh, degrade the view from the neighbors and, and look awkward for the neighbor, neighborhood and, and for the lot. So if you want to look at some of the pictures again, what we're proposing is the back right corner, which would mean we need a variance on those two setbacks, but it would be tucked back in and exactly over the line from my neighbor's garage, and so in a position that would be the least obtrusive in comparison to the other. 
It's, it, so it's kind of in this back corner where this taller section of fence is? Exactly. In fact, it, right where that fence is is where it would be. Is there going to be pavement going from the current driveway down to the garage? Um, it would be the current driveway and then bending around to the, into the garage. Exactly. And is the, will the garage itself have to go to the planning board after you get a variance, or are you all done after this? I don't know, actually. I think, you, I think we'll be all done at that point. Okay. And is the garage you're proposing roughly the same size as your neighbors? Yes. I am, I am told, but I wasn't able to find any records. I bought the house from the Gleasons five years ago that at one point there was a garage there and it, and it was taken down. So. Sorry, when you say there was a, a prior structure there, is it where you have proposed it to be now? Yes. But I wasn't able to find any record of that. But the people who lived there before the Gleasons said that before them there had been a garage in that spot. So. Can you... Uh, uh, Kind of explain again wh where the driveway is going for this, for the garage itself. So I have an existing garage, um, excuse me, existing driveway. Yeah. And I anticipate that we would just have it come around to go so that the cars could go. So I would keep the existing driveway and then just add pavement to come into the garage. So the so the garage doors are essentially facing your back door. Yes. Yeah. And I have included at the end of the package a couple of letters from neighbors, neighbors directly across the street on shore who would see the front on view and directly across the street on Stony Brook. And they support. Has anyone, has anyone told you that they want you doing this? No, everyone's very supportive. And, and in fact, several neighbors and a neighbor just left, as a matter of fact very much want me to get the variance and not have it sitting out front towards the street and in the middle of the yard. So, very <coughs> For uh, reference sakes, where, uh, uh, where is, uh, so you have two letters of support, one at 8 Stony Brook from the uh, Which is directly across Curries. The street. I'm sorry? Yes, that's directly across the street from the lot. <laughs> So they, they would look at the garage more than anyone. <laughs> okay. And then how about uh, 874 Shore Road? The so the Shermans are directly across me on Shore. Okay. I guess Richard Ward seems to be pretty in favor of it, huh? <laughs> He did come over one day and very affectionately say, it's sort of Appalachia out here. <laughs> it's tough when you don't have a place to put your things. By any chance, can, we don't have the ability to just outright grant variances without there being cause. We need to step through certain ordinance criteria that need to be met. Okay. Are you familiar with those criteria? I am not. I, and you are. Yeah. I, I guess one of my, pro my problems that I have here is that with the application, we have some NAs and nuns and whatnot where we have to have an, R an explanation for why these criteria are met. So, uh, for example, criteria number A, uh, in order for a variance to be granted, uh, the need for a variance has to be due to the unique circumstances of the property and not general conditions of the neighborhood. So I guess, can you explain why that is met? Um, so the unique um, circumstances of the property, there are two. It doesn't have a garage, and the, it is a long, thin uh, uh, lot, and so it's, it's almost impossible to meet the setbacks, and if we met the setbacks, it, the garage would be in a very awkward position. It, it, that, I, I don't want to be the heavy here, but... Um... From my perspective, that isn't a unique circumstance of the lot, the narrow, the narrowness of the lot. That's just a common characteristic of the I don't, neighborhood. I don't think we can meet setbacks, period, by putting a garage there. So, in or, so here's the problem that then arises. In order for us to grant a variance, we need to be able to say why the criteria are met in the ordinance. And 
the ordinance doesn't contemplate that everyone in Cape Elizabeth is permitted to build a garage on their property. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to be able to step through each of these criteria and explain why they're met in order to be able to grant. So these criteria need to be met Correct. in order for me to get a variance. Correct. And the first criteria is there are unique circumstances? Uh, yeah, for, for example, we had an, um, a request for a variance, I think it was last month, where the property was almost shaped like a, a Z at mm -hmm. the front, uh, such that it, it created the, uh, this very odd shape to the property. Right. Whereas here we have a, something much closer to a rectangle. Right. And uh, I'd note, I'm familiar with the area, I live down the street on Shore Road, right. and uh, a lot of the houses in the area only have single car garages. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this proposal is a 26-foot wide dual car garage. Mm -hmm. So I guess what justifies granting a variance to build a two-car garage in this location? Well, so we again, again, we have we have the three lots there: 821, 823, and 825. Those are three homes that were built at the same time, very similar, and the garages were put in the same position and very similar to what we're building. So. Right across the fence is a two-car garage of the roughly the same dimension. So trying to be compatible? Un un understood. The, the, the issue that arises for me, though, is that in acquiring the property, you acquired it without a garage. And you received right. a discount in acquiring the property because there was no garage on the property. So to the extent that a variance is granted just for the basis that there is no, currently no garage, it then provides you uh, what some would qualify as a windfall because of the fact that you're then suddenly able to build a garage and then resell the property with the garage on it. But I think what you're saying is that the, the narrowness of the lot compared with the length is what occasions the need for the variance. It's the right. setback would put it kind of over here right. if you could meet it at all, which you're saying you couldn't. And so it's the, the lot size, while it may be relatively normal, the dimensions of the lot are, right. un are unique. Right. Who's, right. Who's, do you have proposals to build something already? No. No, I have not. He's been helping me just spec out and measure where we would put it, but didn't want to invest the money in it with an architect. Um, as, as Chris was, was saying, we kind of go through this, these five criteria. And in mm -hmm. many cases where we have variances <laughs> in this particular um, uh, in, in this particular test where you're being asked to, to explain the unique circumstances of the property, what, what becomes kind of a, um, a rationale is, you, is, that, is that the applicants will, will literally quantify how the variance they're looking for is very similar to what, the, it, very similar to the characteristics of the neighborhood. So you actually said it, and it's one of my questions. Okay. How many garages are there in Stony Brook that have these similar setback issues? And, right. you know, m many, many applicants literally quantify it, like 18 out of 25, oh. well, for okay. example, okay. as opposed to the right. guy next door. Okay. Right. Um, right. That's kind of what we're looking for a little bit is to, to help us understand I, I, I can see the I can see the picture and yes next door there is a garage that would be right. just like the one you have right but my next question is how many homes in in your area okay. are very similar to that and are you the exception to the rule or more or more the norm and that's I think what we're looking for in that particular test so I did not <clears throat> canvas the entire neighborhood and do an exact count um, but I can I can tell you three houses in this direction, the two houses across Stony Brook, and the two houses adjoining my lot all have non-conforming garages. And you can see a couple of pictures there. They've either put them right on the street because they had no other place to put them right up against the lot line, up against two lot lines. Do you know whether this house on lot 117, which the lot looks similar to your lot, it looks like it's narrow, the part that's showing at least? Do you know whether that one has a similar garage? Because it looks like a lot of the other lots are substantially bigger, so that they wouldn't. So on, uh, so 117, right you actually see a picture of that. That's what they did is build it 
If you, if you look at Neighboring Garage Solutions, my fourth page, what they did was put it literally right on the street. Mm. Mm -hmm. They didn't, you know, there were no, there was no recourse on either side of that house. Not a very, not a very aesthetically pleasing approach. But theirs is also non-conforming with regard right. to setbacks. It's right on the, yeah. It's right on the line. And then the picture just below that is my next, my abutting neighbor on Stony Brook. And her garage is right on the lot line as well. And can you provide some explanation for why you need a, or are requesting, or believe a variance is warranted for a two-car side-by-side garage instead of just a one-car garage? Well, it, 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 it's a, you know, it's a family home, and so to invest the money in building a garage, it, it, uh, I think I would be ill-advised to build a single-car garage these days. <laughs> And that will only impact one of the setbacks, right? I mean, you're right. getting a variance for setbacks on two sides. Right, so the that I can corners, put it in the corner. And that would only really impact one right. of the setbacks. Right. And it wouldn't change, it would just exchange, impact the length, not the degree to which you're getting a exactly. variance. Exactly. How much it would come onto the lot. Yeah, you're four foot. <clears throat> Whether you did a one or a two. You know, you're still you're gonna have a, you're still gonna have a setback issue on the on the four foot. So one of the other requirements for granting a variance is that um, there has to be no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance, and a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause practical difficulty. So can you define what the practical difficulty is in this instance for us? Um, the practical difficulty is I don't think that we could actually build the garage and be in compliance. Uh, so I guess, and again, I, I hate being the heavy here, but from my perspective, um, a, a, a practical difficulty can't simply be that you can't otherwise build the, the structure on the property. It, 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 it requires more than that. That there needs to be a true, like, like an Hard economic to... difficulty, like nothing could be built on the property otherwise. Um, the property would be unusable. I think that's for a standard not right. variance, not necessarily for a practical difficulty variance. But I could be wrong. I think the standard is a little bit lower for our variance. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm sorry. Is the house currently on the market out of curiosity? The house is currently on the market. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. So, okay. It, it seems the problem that I'm having here is we have to meet these criteria. I don't see the criteria as necessarily being met, especially for a two-car garage. And it really does create the appearance because of the fact that the house is on the market that granting this variance will, in effect, just be providing you an economic windfall so you can resell the property with a garage. And there is no garage on it. There was no garage when you purchased it. Right. And adding a two-car garage where many houses in the neighborhood have one-car garages, it just, in granting variances on multiple um, setbacks, I, I just don't see the criteria being met here, unfortunately. I, ha I have to say, it's not an economic windfall. It, it's a serious impediment. It's been a serious impediment for me that I have not had a garage. All of the homes around me have garages. Um, it's a substantial investment to build a garage, and it, it, it isn't going to make a, a material difference in what I could or could not sell the house for. So it, it's, I'm not here for economic gain. I'm here because this home needs a garage. I have no place to put my stuff. Every home in the, in the neighborhood has a garage. And, and it's, you know, I've had neighbors ask, please don't build it right on the street. Mm. You know, please, you know, this is what we prefer. And it's, the house needs a garage. 
<laughs> I think some of the one car garages you're talking about are also the same footprint as what we have. I mean, they just have a 18 foot doors that go up and I mean, the, the, the garage right behind that, they, they fit two vehicles in as well. <clears throat> I, I think what I'm hearing from the board generally is that the, the application itself and, and the, the criteria we have to, we go through to evaluate whether this variant to be supported isn't really supported by the application. Um, you know, that, that's, that's the problem that we're struggling with here. We're doing a little Q&A to, Q to see if we can, you know, kind of get there. But, but, I, but I think, you know, for example, it's, it's been raised, you know, you know, why not, a, why not a one car instead of a two car? I mean, as, as an example. You know, how many other, I raised earlier, how many, how many homes have uh, detached, you know, two-car garages, if you will, as opposed to detached one-car garages? Mm -hmm. You know, that's, you know, we need to get a flavor for what the character of, of that neighborhood is as it, as it relates to that. And, um, you know, I, I hear you on, like, it sounds like the lack of storage area and seeing the toys on the top of the, uh, the bushes. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that, again, based upon, we, we have an NA to look at, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure that's creating a practical difficulty. I, I, I hear you have lack of storage, but that, it's not in the application. So, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> you know we're, we're, this is still the Q&A portion, and, and okay. you know, at some point, you know, we'll, we'll talk amongst ourselves, but we're, we're trying, I think, give you a roadmap to try and address some of our concerns in, in your application so that, um, you know, we're, we're trying to help you out here, but yep. I, I think we're, we're struggling with just the content we have right now as far as ruling on the, ruling on the application as presented. Okay. okay. I think to the extent we could go through the criteria in the application and have you even flesh out now verbally kind of how you meet those criteria, that would be really helpful. And if, to the extent we can't do that, because we do need to meet every single one of those criteria, I don't know if there's any way to withdraw and then resubmit with that material more fleshed out and with additional information, if we could table it or something like that. But those are the two options that, I mean, we certainly have to have evidence in the record on each one of those criteria. And just saying not applicable or none is, doesn't get us there. Yeah, so why don't, can we request to withdraw and, and come back with detail on each one of these? Or would you rather go through them verbally now? I, I, mean, it, it, I mean, it might make, I mean, we, we've basically just been discussing <coughs> A, uh, the need for variances due to unique circumstances, just so, you know, to not waste your time. And so when you come back, um, you kind of understand what we need. It, it may make sense just to go through the other ones right now. Perfect. And, and you can get some feedback from the board as to whether or not we think there may be an issue with the others. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, well, I think that's what Joanna was, was suggesting as well. Yeah, I Perfect. think we should try and do that. I wouldn't recommend that. But I mean, I'll get overruled on it by, by <laughs> you guys. But I, I, I don't want us to start setting precedents of essentially doing these applications for people. I mean, I think they want to withdraw and resubmit it. We go from there, but otherwise, I think we're opening it up where people are going to submit things and we're going to be sitting here doing it and, and asking questions so people can keep, you know, we're just, I, I don't think we're in the business of doing the application. I think we're in the business of reviewing the application and asking the questions to determine whether it's met or not, that not actually sitting here and asking the questions to help people fill it out. And maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong, I, just, I don't see that as our, as our role. Mac can defer to, to counsel on that to see what his thought is, but I, I, I just don't want to set that let, let me Let me throw this out. It's, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but I, uh, did you meet with um, the CEO at all? Um, before you feel with them on the phone. Okay. Mm -hmm. But did you kind of I, I might suggest that you you 
sit down with now our new CEO, uh, who starts the 22nd, and, and literally go through um, these five criteria with, with him, and, and then um, come back and see us. So if you'd like to table it or withdraw it, rather than... Can it be tabled? Is that... I'm, trying to, I, I'm not sure if we have to actually... Can it seek advice from the town attorney? All Does right. it have to be withdrawn or could it be amended? We can, no. we can amend it. Um, you could take either approach. Um, I think since the, because what you're really looking for is supplementation uh, of what exists now in terms of an application. Um, if you table it, you have to take a motion, make a motion to table it, and it has to pass. Um, if the applicant would prefer to simply withdraw it and resubmit a new application, she could do that as well, and it wouldn't require any additional action by the board. It would simply be withdrawn. Okay. Pick your poison. <laughs> <laughs> Are you feeling lucky? Um, I think we'll just withdraw it and resubmit it. That okay. seems like it'd be the simplest approach. Great. That work? All right. Good. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. We'll be back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Next uh, on the agenda, we will hear of an administrative appeal from George W. Foley III, Suzanne R. Lindsay, Della Hitchcock, Betsy French, <coughs> Gerald French, uh, Stephen Sutton, and Kimberly Cripps asking the board to override the code enforcement officer approval of building permit 130152 at map U12 lot 071 at 25 Pilot Point Road. And I would just raise for the board, um, I don't think this warrants my uh, recusal at all, but um, the, uh, my wife and I are familiar with the Leopold's uh, social acquaintances with some good friends in common. And uh, Mr. Leopold's unaware of this, but I serve on a local nonprofit, and I mentioned his name as a potential candidate for future nonprofit uh, board member position. So um, to the extent the board thinks that in any way warrants my refusal, I'm raising it. Doesn't bother me, anyone on the board? We take a just unanimous 6 0 vote if that's the case then. I don't think we need to take a vote. I, I prefer. You want a I vote? Think technically, we're supposed to have a vote, so it makes sense to just say. Okay. So for refusal and take the vote. Okay, does the, the board want Chris Straw to recuse himself from this administrative appeal? All in favor? Opposed? I'm not sure what you're doing. Right. <laughs> no one wants you to recruit yourself, Chris. How's that? I'll accept that as a 6 0 for as my role is Perfect. Right here. We even have it on videotape. Could you uh, state your name and uh, address, please? George Foley uh, for uh, 9 Pilot Point Road, Cape Elizabeth. Um, we have a a group of us, I guess, if you will, that have all signed on to this and I've kind of been elected to speak for them. So I'll give it my best shot. <laughs> um, the application as submitted by the authorized agent is a request to expand the structure. The, the brief scope shows it's a proposal for about $700,000 to expand and remove expansion to remove the roof and the first floor and replace the first floor by adding both the first and the second floor. The permit says that they want to add three bedrooms to the existing five. That would make a total of eight. Um, 
The proposed height listed in the permit is 23 feet, uh, 7 and 13 30 seconds inches. Uh, and the property is entirely within the 250 foot shoreland performance overlay district, which makes it subject to sections 19611, the shoreland performance overlay district, and 1982, the shoreland performance standards. And the main state revised statutes annotated MRSA Title 38, Article 2B, mandatory shoreland zoning. In accordance with these sections of the ordinance and state statute, the actual building height is, as best I can figure, approximately 45 feet, 9 inches. The Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance, Article 10, uh, Amendments and Interpretive Provisions, Section 1910.1, Conflict with Other Provisions, States, Whenever a provision of this ordinance conflicts with or is inconsistent with another provision of this ordinance or any other ordinance, regulation, or statute administered by the town, the more restrictive and specific provision shall control. When the Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act was adopted in February 1990, towns had the choice to either accept it as written or they could do as CAPE did and create a separate section within their zoning ordinance using the state statute as a minimum standard. The Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance Section 19611, Shoreland Performance Overlay District, does not include a definition for the method of measurement that it should have. At most, this is an ambiguity, if not simply an inconsistency. In any case, Section 1910.1 allowed the DEP to approve the ordinance as written because the measurement methodology for this section is included by reference and state requirement. Let me walk you through uh, the ordinance to determine how we got there. This property is located in the RA district and entirely within the 250-foot shoreland performance overlay district as shown in your zoning ordinance on the official map that was made part of that ordinance by section 19.2.2 zoning map. The purpose of the shoreland overlay performance district is stated in 19.6.11 and you can read it yourself but it's basically the A, it's paragraph A where it says in order to maintain health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera to protect visual Okay? and to conserve the natural beauty that we have in our town. I have the exact quote if you want me to read it, but I'm pretty sure you can find it in, the, in that section. And down at the bottom of that, it says, uh, to anticipate and respond to the impact of development in shoreland areas, all land use activities within the shoreland performance overlay district shall conform to the applicable land use standards of section 1982, shoreland performance standards, and the district is established in accordance with the provisions of 38 MRSA 435 ETSEQ. Let me repeat that. That basically means that the Shoreland Performance Overlay District for Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance in Section 19611 is established in accordance with the provisions of the main state statute governing shoreland zoning, 38 MRSA 435 ETSEQ, and sets the minimum standards defined by that uh, MRSA. Can I interrupt for a second? Yes. Is what you're saying that because the shoreland portion of the town's ordinance did not adopt the state model language for calculating height, that we therefore must default to the model definition instead of using our ordinance's definition of height? 
What I'm saying is that by making it a separate section and not by making the height a separate section, putting it in the regular by ordinance, the shoreland zoning in there by adding that in, you've accepted that you're using the MRSA as the minimum standards. And although you've included um, some of the provisions, you haven't included all of them, but by reference, you have. And I'll get to that as we get along through here. Um, As I said, it says right in the standards there, this district is established in accordance with the provisions of MSRA uh, 38. In accordance is defined in Miriam's dictionary as, in, as agreement and conformity. In accordance with is defined in the Cambridge dictionary as in agreement with to follow, to obey. ETSEQ is a Latin phrase meaning and following. It's commonly used by lawyers I needn't tell you, but for the purposes of everyone else, uh, to include numbered list pages, sections after the first section is stated. In this case, it refers to sections 435 through 438, 439, excuse me, 449 of MSRA 38. I think 449 was repealed. So, if the intent of the law was to require that every town put in place the exact language of the model, then why wouldn't the statute have simply put the model in place in every town? In fact, that. that's not what happened. In fact, what happened was that the state required that we put in, our, in place our own ordinances and allowed us the discretion to change certain provisions. If you'll allow me to finish the presentation, I'll show you where the state has said in every case that these are the minimum standards that must be applied. The state, the town, can include these in their own ordinance and make them more restrictive, but they can't make them less restrictive without following a specific procedure. In this case, how that would a procedure height, hasn't been... How would a height measurement mechanism impact the substance of the applicable shoreland zoning ordinance? Well, it decides how high a building can be. Indeed, but how does that go to the heart of what a shoreland ordinance does or does not do? As I stated in the beginning, the, at the beginning of the shoreland, it is also to protect the visual as well as actual, uh, let's see, protect shoreland cover, protect visual, conserve natural beauty of open space. It just says um, protect visual. To protect visual. So, okay. so it has the, there's a whole paragraph in there. Um, it's right in your ordinance. Um, section uh, 19.611. Okay. So, let's see where we are here. Right, so basically, um, and I'll get to why it's important about the minimum, but the Maine State Revised Statute uh, defines the methodology for ensuring, for measuring the height of a structure within the shoreland overlay district. And it says in 7A, the height of a structure means the vertical distance between the mean original grade at the downhill side of the structure prior to construction and the highest point of the structure, excluding chimneys, steeples, antennas, and similar appurtenances that have no floor area. But, but isn't that a methodology? Not, that's not providing any minimum, any minimum requirements. That's just this the is the minimum requirement but it, for that's, measuring that's height. But, but that doesn't. But that doesn't. Then it doesn't. Then follow in the statute that there is a minimum height or a maximum height that can be built. There this is. is the statute specifies 35 feet. The statute specifies for 35 Sorry. feet. As does your zoning ordinance. Okay. So we are not in disagreement there. The issue is how the 35 is calculated. The issue is how it's calculated, and within the shoreland zone, the state has mandated that 
as a minimum, you start with this definition of how to calculate it. And Didn't I see a response from DEP in the record <laughs> stating that they did not consider this mechanism substantive and that they were reviewing the ordinance and looking at items including this and in fact I can't speak to what you saw but I can say that if you let me finish I have references in here that will help you with that um, the main Department of Environmental Protection chapter 1000 guidelines for municipal shoreland zoning ordinances contains the following text in the preface the Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act, MRSA uh, 38, sections 435 to 449, requires all municipalities to adopt, administer, and enforce ordinances that regulate land use activities within 250 feet of great ponds, fresh rivers, uh, fresh water, and coastal wetlands, including all tidal waters, and within 75 feet of streams as defined. The Act also requires that the Board of Environmental Protection establish the minimum guidelines for such ordinances. This document, adopted by the Board February 1990 and amended in a variety of different places, contains those guidelines for municipal shoreland ordinances. The Act requires that municipalities adopt shoreland zoning ordinances consistent with or no less stringent than those minimum guidelines. Municipalities need not, as this speaks to your point, adopt the guidelines word for word. In fact, the Department of Environmental Protection encourages municipalities to consider local planning documents and other special considerations and to modify this ordinance into one that meets the needs of the particular community. Municipalities may wish to adopt more stringent ordinances or ordinances that are completely different from the guidelines provided that such ordinances are equally or more effective in achieving the purposes of the Act. In addition, coastal communities must address coastal management policies cited in another section. When a municipality determines, and here's the reason why that we've accepted 38, when a municipality determines that a special local conditions within portions of the shoreland zone require a different set of standards from those in the minimum guidelines, the municipality shall document the special conditions and submit them together with its proposed ordinances to the commissioner in the department for review and approval. No amendment to the ordinance which affects the shoreland zone is valid without the approval of the commissioner. So there's a special set of guidelines that you have to follow. But you to yourself the have indicated that the standards that the town has are identical to those in the model, that being a height restriction of 35 feet. What you're disputing is the mechanism for calculating the 35 feet. Correct. And that's in, as I said, definition 7A. Right, of which title isn't 38. necessarily a standard applicable in the shoreland zone. It is. But that's 35 feet is a standard. And the, the mechanism for, for determining 35 also. feet is not a standard. It's a methodology I'm, I'm, for determining 35 feet. It's a standard because if you didn't have that, you could say, well, I'm only going to measure the 35 feet starting at the roof line. I mean, so I can build anything up to the roof line and go from there. I mean, your argument is essentially that the zoning, the Cape zoning ordinance is less restrictive than it's required to be under state law? Mm -hmm. I think that's mostly it, yes. I now, have a bunch of different sites to show you no, why. No, and, and I, I understand that argument. but. I guess the, the trouble that I'm having is how can we as a board, where our, our job is to apply our, the zoning ordinance? Correct. You're, look at, you're asking us to look outside the zoning ordinance. No. Well, it's part of, it's made part of it through reference right there in the zoning ordinance. Do you know when 7A was adopted? 
I believe 7A was, I don't know if as it wondering if it was specific, adopted in 2011. I do not know if it was a specific piece of the, um, I think it might say in here, hang on. And then also if you could provide me the exact citation to the portion of the uh, statute, stat uh, the relevant statute that you were referring to that required documentation by the town before deviation from a minimum standard. Yes, the, uh, it's in, as I said, chapter 1000, okay? It's in chapter the, 1000 of the DEP rules. DEP, so it's a DEP rule, it's not. This is the basis statute. for which the shoreland zoning arrived in our ordinance. So, so you're saying the DEP rules require this documentation process, not the actual statute? If we want to vary, when we construct our zoning, if we want to vary from their minimum standards by lessening them, there is a procedure that we must follow. Otherwise... And when was that adopted? Do you know? Uh, I believe it was um, February 14th, 1990. The DEP rule was adopted in 1990? Correct. Do you know if our, uh, our height calculations and our ordinance were adopted prior to that time? Um, and then again, my problem is also, I think 7A in the statute, the height of the structure that you're pointing to is setting a baseline that's higher than what's in our uh, town ordinance. My concern is that that was adopted in 2011. What was adopted in 2011? The definition 7A, height of a structure. Height of a structure means the vertical distance between the mean original grade on the downhill side of the structure prior to construction and the highest point of the structure, excluding chimneys, steeples, antennas, and other similar... I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce it. 7A in, in, in where, though? In, 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 the, in the statute. Uh, for Title 38, Chapter 3, um, right. Section 436-A, Definitions, Head of a Structure, 7A. My concern is that that was adopted in 2011, which means it came about after our ordinance was already in effect. The, uh, I've just been told that the only change to that particular piece was for the appurtenances. App or <laughs> um, all the rest of it was there before. Got it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So getting back then, the basis <coughs> for incorporating shoreland zoning into our zoning came from Chapter 1000, and that generated the MRSA, the state laws required, for us to adhere to, and we've incorporated them into our zoning by reference in the um, thing saying that we've complied with that. Uh, so I said municipalities need not adopt that. There's a procedure if they want to go less than. So in other words, what you're saying is under the DEP regulations, there's a process that needs to be followed if you want to deviate from the minimum uh, requirements and basically there needs to be documentations that so that a town can't in effect slip something through that otherwise uh, the DEP might miss. Is Correct. That, okay. Sorry, go on. It's okay. Now section, uh, again, chapter 1000, section 17 uh, defines the height of a structure, okay, as the vertical distance between the mean original grade prior to construction and the grade at the downhill side of the structure uh, to the highest point of the structure, again, excluding chimney steeples, antennas, and other similar appurtenances that have no floor area. Chapter 1000 goes on to say that for more information on the shoreland zoning law, please contact the Department of Environmental Protection's shoreland zoning unit in Augusta. I did that. I called the state DEP in Augusta, spoke to the on-call person in the shoreland zoning and they confirmed that this is the required methodology. Finally, in Chapter 1000, Section 7, it says, conflicts with other ordinances. Whenever a provision of this ordinance conflicts with or is inconsistent with another provision of this ordinance or any other ordinance, regulation, or statute administered by the municipality, the more restrictive provision shall control. As we move on to Title 38, uh, in section 438A, the municipal authority 
and state oversight says, with respect to all shoreland zoning areas described in section 435, municipalities shall adopt zoning and land use control ordinances pursuant to the to existing enabling legislation under home rule authority and in accordance with the following requirements. The deadline for the municipals, municipalities to adopt shoreland zoning ordinance meeting the minimum guidelines adopted by the Board of Environmental Protection is extended to July 1st, 1992. In the next section down, it says land use guidelines. It's marked as uh, one, item one. In accordance with Title V, Chapter 375, sub, sub Chapter 2, the Board of Environmental Protection shall adopt and from time to time shall update, amend the, the minimum guidelines for municipal zoning and land use controls that are designed to carry out the legislative purposes described in Section 435 and the provisions of this article. These minimum guidelines must include provisions governing building and structure size, setback, location, establishment of resource protection, et cetera, et cetera. Item two under there, municipal ordinances. In accordance with the schedule adopted by the board and acting in accordance with the local comprehensive plan, the municipalities shall prepare and submit to the commissioner zoning and land use ordinances that are consistent with or no less stringent than the minimum guidelines adopted by the board and for coastal communities that address the coastal management policies as cited in section 1801. Commissioner approval, that's the next item, item three. Municipal ordinances, amendments, and any repeals of ordinances that are not effective, are not effective unless the, approved by the commissioner. In determining whether to approve municipal ordinances or amendments, the commissioner shall consider the legislative purposes, the minimum guidelines, and any special local conditions which in the judgment of the commissioner justify departure from the requirements of the minimum guidelines in a manner not inconsistent with the legislative purposes. I think we can all agree that there was, that the legislature passed 38 MRSA requiring that the DEP through the commissioner and the board issue minimum guidelines for shoreland zoning back in 1990 and requiring that municipalities put those in place before the, the middle of 92 and that Cape Elizabeth did so and submitted its ordinance, which has been in effect since before the deadline. Correct. So we now have that in place, and we did not request any reduction in those minimum standards. Uh, the, the methodology as defined is more restrictive in all cases than the methodology found in the definitions in the front of the CAPE zoning ordinances that apply to structures outside of the shoreland zone. But the problem is it really does look to me like 7A, which is what this all turns on, is that definition that has now been added to the statute. It looks like it was passed in 2011. No, that was simply they changed it to add the appurtenances at the end. The rest was there before. You can go back and look if you'd like. I mean, it's there. So we get back to the, um, let's see, and I've lost my place. At the end of the day, it's irrelevant whether that language was or was not in statute because it's not a standard and because it's, I don't see the argument that the standard that we do have regarding calculation of height was prohibited or is less restrictive than what is on the books under the guidelines. It is less restrictive. It allows for higher buildings than 35 feet. No, it allows for a different calculation of what is 35 feet. It doesn't allow for buildings which that are is, higher than 35 feet. Which is less restrictive than the state requirement. On that, we can disagree. 35 feet is 35 feet. <coughs> you're, you're saying that the state requires the height to be calculated in a particular way? Yes. Okay. And our ordinance 
says that the height should be calculated in a different way. Outside of the zone, that's correct. Inside of the zone, the minimum standards set by the state require it to be calculated in this method. And again, the problem is I'm staring at the LD and it looks like it's adopted in 2011. Look at the one before. You, if you look but back at the versions. It, it didn't strike an existing uh, section of the statute. It just added a new section. But if you look at the old version, it's there the same way. Do you know what the former MRS citation was? I don't have that okay. excerpted out. Mr. Foley. Mr. Foley. Is there, I mean, is there more to your presentation? There is. Um, okay, so as I said, in all cases that the thing is more restrictive as applied by the state statute, MRSA 38. Um, let's see. The short, the Cape zoning ordinance is fine as approved by the DEP because the Shoreland Overlay District per section uh, 1936.11a is established in accordance with the statute MRSA 38 where the methodology is defined. Um, and the Cape Zoning Ordinance says again in 1910 that wherever it's conflicts with or is inconsistent with, consistency again means done the same way, the more restrictive shall control. It's not an option. So we know that it must comply with 38 and uh, 435 ETSEQ and uh, because if it did not, Cape Elizabeth would be subject to Title 38 MRSA 443-A cooperation and enforcement, enforcement, which says remedies any number three, any municipality that fails to adopt, administer, or enforce zoning and land use ordinances as required under this article is subject to enforcement procedures and equitable remedies and so forth. And then the enforcement paragraph says where any person who orders or conducts an activity in violation of the municipal ordinance adopted under this chapter is penalized in accordance with Title 30A. The MRSA 38 subsection 480C provision says um, in its prohibition that a person may not perform or cause to be performed any activity listed in subsection 2 without first obtaining a permit from the department if any activity is located in, on, or over any protected natural resource or located adjacent to any of the following. And in A it says a coastal wetland, great pond, et cetera, et cetera, but the coastal wetland is particular. The activities that require a permit are construction in D, construction, repair, or alteration of any permanent structure. As of 1.15 p.m. today, the town file does not contain any permit issued by DEP for this property. Next, the code enforcement officer is required to cite the provisions of the ordinance that apply in writing pursuant to the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance, subsection 1833D, <coughs> when making his decision on an application to approve, deny, or referring an application to another body. This was not done. The owner of the property is responsible for knowing town, state, and federal laws that apply to any proposed project undertaken in the development of a property. If that research, however extensive, is incomplete, the property owner is still responsible for compliance. So basically, to summarize, we have, by reference, in and by the basis of the state saying we must use these as the minimum standards, 7A, which says here's how you measure, we need to apply that to this application. 
The code enforcement officer needs to cite all of the relevant pieces when he approves or denies or refers an application. And it's the property owner that is responsible for all of the compliance. If you need more on how the height shows up and why it's important, I do have the <coughs> plans from the um, applicant because it does make a difference as to high, how, how high the buildings are. If we use the standard that's in our ordinance for calculating height, are we within 35 feet? If you were to apply the, the, the one that applies for outside of the shoreland? There's, as I understand it, there's one definition of height that includes a mechanism for how you calculate the 35 feet of allowable height. If we use that mechanism, is the structure within 35 feet? I believe when we did the math, did, did we come up with that for the... Oh, by the way, I have... Uh... Here we go. This one, too, the main shoreland zone, this shows how that... To the extent you can give a copy to. defer to Deb so she can give us a little more information. Uh, some other stuff. I was asked to help out a little bit. You've seen me before uh, just because I've done so much work. My name is Deborah Murphy. I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. I am not someone that is, uh, sorry I speak softly. I'm not, I'm not listed on the appeal but I'm a neighborhood, um, someone in the neighborhood. I think the point is, um, Joanna, that in the Cape Ordinance on page 136, section 19611, Shoreland Performance Overlay District, in the purpose, the very last sentence of the purpose says, this district, the Shoreland Performance Overlay District, this district is established in accordance with the provisions of 38. MRSA 435 ET SEQ. Because of that, you would then go to that statute and you would see what the methodology is. I'm pretty comfortable with how that works. I'm, what I'm looking for you to answer is whether if we use the mechanism that's in our ordinance for calculating height, and our height line is 35 feet, just like the state yes. minimum standards, right. is this structure below 35 feet as calculated in our ordinance. You're trying to get me to go be outside of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District. Outside no, I'm looking to our ordinance to provide so the definition. So am I. And I'm saying height. that the district is established in accordance with the provisions of 38 MRSA. That doesn't mean that we go to the statute. So Joanna, uh, yeah. let, let's, uh, so we can all get on common ground here uh, rather than uh, mince words on this point. Under the generic definition of how to, jet, uh, how to calculate height at the very beginning of our ordinance, if that is the definition that applies and not the one that's in uh, the MRSA, is it under 35 feet? I'm not sure. I am because I haven't looked at that. I'm not I sure. I believe one of the emails that we have in the record says that it is. Yeah. And then to, I wanted to speak to just Joan, you had mentioned something about a letter from the DEP. And I did call the rules making um, folks and talk to Michael Carragant. Who did you speak with? DEP, Michael Carraganis, and also Deirdre Schneider. Mm -hmm. And that there was some talk about moving the measurement at some point in time to the uphill side. It has not been done yet. 
Um, it's probably anywhere from a year and a half to two and a half years out for the legislature to consider it. And before doing so, it needs to be referred to the state fire marshal's office. So, well, you had mentioned it before, so I'm just addressing that. So it's, it's an, and it, a lot can happen between now and then that that might not happen. So for that to be in a letter, it's information, but it's not part of the law. That's not the... So I just... Um, there was an email exchange that was submitted as part oh. of the record on this. I'm not talking about uh -oh. something that's outside the record where someone... No, that was... The, that that, was and that's what I'm speaking to. That was named on the appeal. I believe it was a Ms. Foley, but I could have that wrong. It was Mrs. Freeman. Okay. Um, and that's what I'm referring to. Had emailed to. and asked... Okay. Right. Right. It was submitted as part of this appeal. It's part of the right. record in this appeal. Am I wrong on that? No, it is, it is. Okay. I, I think it is. And I haven't seen the whole record because I was brought in just to, to assist here. But, um, I mean, I had written a letter just in concern to um, Mike as the, uh, you, I think at the time you were, you were acting or whatever, code enforcement officer. And I just, just to read what I wrote, I wrote, um, we had seen him at a town council meeting where we were supporting you and all of us in trying to establish some notification, which is a good thing. <laughs> I think we all can agree. Um, good morning, Mike. It was nice to see you at the town council workshop last night. It's good to know that we have such dedicated people advocating for us. We all want to do what is best for our community and working together we can. Thanks for forwarding Mike Morse's letter to me, which is the one that went to Mrs. Freeman. My advice is not to use this letter to allow something that is illegal or unethical. This would not be good for the town of Cape Elizabeth and its citizens. I'm requesting and would strongly advise notification to the Leopolds to stop work on the 45-foot expansion until further review. Would you please take a more thorough look at the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance as I believe that Mike Morse is mistaken and that the town may be liable for allowing this 45-foot plus structure to be built. The definition for height building is a definition that does not, does apply in Cape Elizabeth and is valid for anything other than structures in the Shoreland Performance Overlay District and the RP districts. The more restrictive language in, this, in section 19611A, page 136, would prevail. This district is established in accordance with the provisions of 38 MRSA 435 ETSEQ. Also, please refer to section 1913, page 2, where the reference is made to town or state laws ordinances or regulations, each reference to a particular law, regulation, or section shall include all amendments and successor sections. Please also refer to section 1910.1 on page 232, conflict with other provisions. Whenever a provision of this ordinance conflicts with or is inconsistent with another provision of this ordinance, regulation, or state statute administered by the town, the more restrictive and specific provision shall control. And I wrote, people who own homes in the Shoreland Zone have a responsibility to understand and abide by the state statutes. This information is readily available to them. They must do the due diligence to know what they can or cannot do. There is no other municipality in the state of Maine that is allowed to get away with violating state statutes, and I sincerely hope that Cape Elizabeth does not attempt to do so for the reasons stated above. To do so puts our town at risk for lawsuits, and most importantly, it will tear at the very fabric that makes us a community. Your attention to this matter is very much appreciated. The reason why, when you ask about, in all cases, the definition in the definition section would lead to allowing taller buildings, because you're giving an average from the bottom and an average from the top. So if the Cape Elizabeth, and it does, the Cape Elizabeth ordinance in the Shoreland Performance Overlay District, the section that was established because of Chapter 1000, because of the mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act that also has the state statutes that support it, that section states this district is established in accordance with the provisions of 38 MSRA 430. And while that's true, our height definitions are still what controls. That but is the law in Cape Elizabeth. Not for Shoreland. Not for Shoreland. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Not according to Augusta. 
we can disagree on that. Mrs. Murphy, do you have anything further? No, thank you. Okay. I'd, I'd like to, if we could, uh, hear from the Leopolds. Good evening. I'm John Schumadine with the law firm Murray Plum & Murray. I represent the Leopolds in this matter. Uh, everything in that presentation was wrong and fundamentally misunderstands the Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act. And I'm going to go through it because apparently that's what needs to happen here. But before I do, I would like to clarify or at least see if we can get some clarification on I think what's the crucial, ca crucial issue in this case. And that's the question that um, Joanna asked earlier. What I'd like to hear is if the appellant could confirm for us that they have no argument saying that if the height restriction definition in the ordinance applies, they, have no, they, they do not argue that we exceed the height measurement underneath that definition. If they have an argument that we do, I'd like to hear it. If they don't, I think the least they can do is, is concede that point so that we can then move on to the issue that they've spent all of their time talking about. If they refuse to, then I've got to spend some time going through why we meet it, which I think we do. But I'd rather go through why we meet it in response to an actual argument rather than a, I just don't know. So maybe the appellant, who apparently is not listening, uh, so I, I guess the issue is, and I would somewhat agree with you here, that um, we need to determine if there's actually a factual dispute under the, I'll call it the generic definition at the very beginning of our ordinance. Actually, I, I, here's, the, here's an easier way to, I want to, what I like, what I think is going on here, I think, is everyone agrees that if the Cape Elizabeth ordinance definition of height applies, we're in compliance. They're saying it doesn't apply and we don't comply. But I don't know that that's what they're saying. They're not quite saying that, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, but what they've, they've hemmed and hawed a little bit and danced around, but um, I'll give them credit for doing that, is that there's a general definition at the beginning of the ordinance, seems to be their argument. And they're not saying that uh, our ordinance is necessarily in conflict with uh, the state requirements because they're saying that our shoreland overlay performance zone, and I realize I didn't perfectly name it there, uh, is silent. So they're basically, they were trying to say. Uh, okay, that, that's a legal argument and we can address that. Yeah. But what I'm just trying to get at is, before we even address that, do we also have an argument about whether we, f we satisfy the height agreement, height, height standard under the generic, exactly. you will. Let's just call it the generic. Uh, well, it's Cape not. It, <laughs> well, the Cape standard. Could it is dispute, the Cape standard. It would not, dispute the Cape standard. We are calling the Cape standard the generic standard for purposes of, of get, seeing whether we have a factual dispute or not. So I, I just like to hear whether they, they think we meet it or don't meet it under the, the quote unquote, which I'm not endorsing, but generic standard. And for expedience, I would think that would be good if we could just find out if there is a dispute, because then we wouldn't have to hear from the other side. M Mr. Foley? Uh, I'm looking up the definition now. I wasn't prepared for this since it doesn't apply, but um, let's see. <coughs> I, I, actually, I thought, I thought this is where you, you had Mrs. Murphy segue in about the, with the, uh, the dimensions. I thought that we might have during the course of our investigation even looked at that, but I, we didn't really consider it because by Title 38 and the way the shoreland zoning is adopted and so forth, it doesn't apply. So we didn't calculate for something that didn't apply. We used what does apply, which is the minimum standards for the shoreland zoning as specified by the state. Because, as Chris said, we're silent on it in our ordinance. It has to default back to those minimum standards from the state as we apply our, as we look to apply our zoning to this okay. particular so, project. So, so, <clears throat> so, so no one in the, so, so the, so, so no one in the group has run a calculation as to whether, based upon 
a generic definition in the ordinance, if you will, the, the height restriction is with, within or inside or outside the 35 foot height restriction? Um, we haven't, but I can tell you that the represented height in the application is incorrect. They said, as I, I think I said in my thing, it was 27 feet or 23 feet, they said was the height. But that's not the correct measurement, even by our standards, even by the standards, excuse me, that are outside of the ordinance, because they're measuring it from the pilot point road level and going up. They're not measuring it from the uh, mean, what does it say in here? Uh, the average original grade to the, uh, of the property. They're measuring it from the top highest point of the, of the land and going up from there. Okay, did, so, so I'm just gonna be but precise didn't here. But CV and Mahar did those calculations, right? And then they were submitted to DEP and DEP said, look, yeah, you need to use what's in the Cape Ordinance. Well, it's, uh, let me, let me let You'd me have back to speak up. to that, because... If, if we look at the definition of height in the ordinance, the, we'll call it the generic definition, has a, have you all run a calculation on that basis or not? No. Okay. So then they don't... Just, I mean, so then, we, then, then the answer is we don't know. <clears throat> they don't there's know. no evidence to dispute. <clears throat> okay. So, so, there's, so there's no factual dis... So there's no factual dispute. I did say in my presentation that the... Applicant has used, let's see, they said the proposed structure height is 23 feet, 7 and 13 30 seconds inches. If you look at their structure height in what they sent me, which would be this exhibit here, their exhibit B, I guess, in their form. It shows that the height from the pilot point road level is, oh, gee, look at that, 23 feet, 7 and 13, 30 seconds inches. It is not measured correctly. Uh, well, I mean, it's based on the ordinance. They're, they're <coughs> measuring it based on the ordinance. They said the that the generic language in the ordinance. In their application, no, not even that. They said that their in their application is 23 feet, 7 whatever. So if you look at this, they're not showing the mean average grade. They're in fact showing the height of the structure from the pilot point road. Is this the Sebago Technics plan or is this something else? All right. Uh, it appears. Not Sebago Technics. But Sebago Technics verified is, the heights. This is submitted from the Leopold. Yeah, this but is it's a the different Rostis, argument, though. You're not arguing that it exceeds 35 feet. You're, you're arguing that the application was inaccurate. But standing here today, you are not arguing that the structure, the height calculated under the generic definition of height exceeds 35 feet. That, that's we not haven't what calculated it, but we can try to calculate that and see what we come up with. But the, for the purposes of this appeal, you are not arguing on this appeal at this point in time that it exceeds 35 feet under the generic definition in our, in our, at the beginning of our ordinance. We're, we're just attempting to determine if the appellee's attorney is going to need to address this argument or not. It, it, and if you can say, no, you're not disputing the issue, then he won't need to address it. If you say, yes, you are disputing it, he will need to address it. So we just need to know okay. one way or the other. Yes, I am disputing it. But now. you've introduced absolutely nothing to support that. Is That's that correct? Well, okay. we'll go ahead and address it since right. they, they are apparently... Which piece of to, right? I still want to pull yours. That one? No, that yours. Okay. In the meantime, I'll try to... All right, well, we're going to address that issue first then, because I think that's really the only issue that matters in contrast to everything that they argued. Uh, I did provide a letter to the ZBA. I hope that everyone has it. It goes, it's the letter that uh, Mr. Foley just showed Exhibit B to. Uh, in contrast to Mr. Foley's representations, I suppose he didn't read my letter, 
since in my letter I go through exactly why, although it is 23 feet and 7 inches from the front, it's actually under 35 feet when you measure it as required under the ordinance from the mean average grade. I tried to be, I, I understand this is a little complicated. If anyone feels like they, on the board, feels that they need more on that, I can have the builder come up and explain how we did the calculation. Uh, but I think that we've laid it out and shown that under the ordinance standard for height and how you measure height, we're under 35 feet. We're under 35 feet by a couple of feet. So can I just have you confirm that the plan <coughs> that I'm looking at, which is Exhibit B, which is described as the Rust Doucette Custom Builders Leopold Residence Plan, right. includes the calculations. The calculations shown on this plan were the calculations that were verified by Sebago Technics. Uh, what Sebago Technics, well, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. What Sebago Technics did was they calculated the elevations of the original structure all around it, mm -hmm. and then established what, what the elevation of the mean average grade was. Mm -hmm. And then from that, they also established basically what the average, what the grade was at the front of the building. So if you use this calculation, or this from the rust you set, mm -hmm. and then you subtract what's the grade, the highest grade at the front from the mean average grade. So using the CAPE definition. Using the CAPE definition. Or the generic then, definition. Or the generic definition. And then you add it to 23, 7, you come up with a number that uh, escapes me right now, but is under 35. That's how we calculated it. I think that that's what the ordinance calls for, and I think that, that unless someone wants more, and since there is no evidence to the contrary, I think we've shown that we satisfy the requirements <coughs> under the CAPE ordinance. I guess my question is, if we were to look at the state statutory definition, for or it's not even a definition, it's a methodology for calculating height. Using these same numbers, is it over 35? And I haven't seen any calculation, and certainly it's not your task necessarily to answer that question for me. <laughs> I don't know, actually, uh, to be honest with you. I, mean, I think it might be, because we only have two feet, and I can't remember how far down from the mean average grade it goes to the, the lowest grade. And the state statute does say it's the lowest grade. Of course, so I can't say to you that it doesn't matter what the definition is, which mm -hmm. may, you know, and then the argument would be moot. If I could, I would love to, but I can't. <laughs> However, I do think that the state, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, just simply does not apply. It's irrelevant. In fact, their entire argument is effectively irrelevant. It stems from a fundamental misunderstanding of shoreland zoning at, at, at its most basic level. And it stems from a fundamental misunderstanding of the Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act, what it does how it's administered, and how it operates. And that's why I think we've spent all this time talking about stuff that simply doesn't matter. If you look at the 19-10-1 language that they're talking about, the conflicts with other ordinances, the key language there is a statute administered by the town. The Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act, in other words, what's in the state statute, is not administered by the town. It's administered by the DEP. Because the way that that statute works is pretty simple. It says, we're going to have mandatory shoreland zoning. And we're going to do that at the local level. So what we're going to do is we're going to require every municipality to have mandatory shoreland zoning. But we're not going to do it by statute, because we recognize that every municipality has differences. So we're going to require that every municipality enact its own zoning ordinance. That is a shoreland zoning ordinance. But we want them to satisfy certain standards. So we're going to require that every one of those ordinances that a municipality act, it enacts gets approved by the commissioner of the DEP. And that's how this all works. 
The DEP is administering that statute because it is the one reviewing all the municipalities, all their ordinances, approving them or not approving them, or in instances when municipalities refuse to enact one or simply enact one that's way off the charts, enacting the, the chapter 1000, which is the, the model guidelines, wholesale for those, uh, uh, for those municipalities. In fact, Perhaps you can address the, the part of the argument that, for me, carried the most weight or uh, did the, the best in articulating a position that was somewhat convincing, although I have another issue with that. Um, specifically, the argument that to the extent that you, that you deviate from a minimum guideline and go below a minimum guideline, that it needs to be explicitly called out so that it, it isn't inadvertently approved by the DEP. It's not. Uh, <laughs> Again, it, that's a DEP issue. Because again, what we're going to, but it is, it's completely a DEP issue. Because again, the way that the statute is administered is the DEP then goes and it enacts, or it, it approves or disapproves. If someone, if a municipality refuses to do that and, and goes below or goes above or is less stringent and fails to provide the requisite documentation or whatever, that's an issue for the DEP to raise. John, your, your position, not to cut you off, but I mean, your position is essentially once the DEP gives its blessing, the municipality, they, they, they enforce their ordinance, and there's a problem with how the DEP <coughs> enacted something, you've got to take it up with the DEP. Right, and the DEP will take it up, and the DEP will take it up with the municipality if there's a problem. Yeah. You, can, you can go search cases, and there are cases in which the DEP has sued towns, forcing them to invalidate certain portions of their ordinances that were not in compliance. And the town said, yes, they were, and the DEP said no, and the DEP won. And that's the way it works. That's what happens. But once the DEP is, gives its, this, the town's ordinance its blessing, and it has done so in CAPE on the height definition since at least 1992, once it does that, you're done with the guidelines. You're done with the statute. You're not talking about those things anymore. You are talking about the ordinance and only the ordinance. And just to kind of further hammer that, put that issue to bed, if you will, this exact situation was brought in front of DEP. They reviewed it and sent back a letter that is in the record that says, as discussed above, the town must apply its legally effective and locally adopted ordinance since it has been approved by the department. But we can agree that an ordinance can't trump uh, the MRSA. Once it is put in place only and approved MRSA's, by DEP. Only in situations where the MRSA says a local ordinance approved by the agency may trump this portion of the statute. If you're talking about a general principle, yes, yeah, an general ordinance principle. is not going to trump the MRSA, so but in this that general principle does not apply to this case. Because if you look at the, look at the statute, Look at the statute itself. What does it say? It says that municipalities shall adopt zoning ordinances that comply with this. That is the operative language of the, of the statute. The statute is not saying you, private property owner, cannot build within certain things. It's saying Munici municipality, you have to do something. Town, you have to do something. That is what the statute is directed at. So another way of looking at it is the statute says something has to happen. The something that has to happen is directed at the municipality. So the municipality is the only actor here. Once the municipality acts in accordance with the statute, the statute is basically out of the equation because you're not talking about it anymore. Including the definitions? Including the definitions, absolutely. So, so I guess I'm still on the fence as to what, whether all of Article 2B mandatory shoreland zoning is basically trumped by an ordinance once it's approved. But it's or not, if it's just a small section. It's not trumped. It's not trumped. If, if, yeah, I, because I, the DEP I mean, has approved it. Use of the word. Um, so we, we'll, we'll avoid the word trumped. Whether it is uh, replaced by the local ordinance. Um, permissibly replaced by the local ordinance. The, the I, I think the, the question the, is... I have a problem with replaced too. <laughs> and I'll tell so, you... Can I tell you why? Cause, sure. Because I think... That's where we're fundamentally misunderstanding each other. They serve two different purposes. They're directed to two different bodies. <coughs> the statute is directed at municipalities. The ordinance is directed at property owners. 
okay? Nothing in the statute is really directed at a property owner. It's directed at a municipality. But that argument then would further say that nothing in the statute is to be relied upon in interpreting local ordinances. Is that what you're in effect saying? Because basically the argument here, and I'm not saying I even agree with them that this applies, is that there is a definition section in the statute. The definition section in the statute defines height of a structure and how it's calculated. They're saying that that definition is still in effect in the MRSA, and that it, our ordinance does not trump that. The, in effect, it sounds like your argument is that our ordinance, and I know you don't like the word trump that I was using, has in effect trumped the definition of height of a structure found in the definition section of the statute. And I guess, can you point to anything that says that once the DEP, DEP approves an ordinance, it trumps the, and I realize you don't like the word trumps, the definition section of the statute. Well, it's actually more complicated than that because the statute went to DEP and said, DEP, you come up with these guidelines and make the towns put in shoreland zoning because we don't have anything right now. So DEP created the model guidelines, the chapter 1000 shoreland zoning, and said, look, Towns, you better come up with something. Otherwise, this is what you get. And, and I, I, I hear there's everything no you're trumping. saying. There's those definitions. And this is the issue I see with the appeal: is that I'm looking at the statute, and well, it looks actually, like 7A was adopted in 2011. Here, here's a, here's another another way of looking at that. Let's say that Cape Elizabeth said, "No, we're not going to adopt anything." And the DEP is going to come along and it's going to, they're going to say, okay, well, we don't care. You're going to get the, the model guidelines. There's going to be a lag time between the enactment, the D, this Cape Elizabeth telling them no, and the model guidelines becoming in effect in Cape Elizabeth. During that time period, there is still no shoreland zoning in Cape Elizabeth. Those definitions do not apply. Because again, those definitions are basically just guidelines. It only becomes effective and only the, 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 they only hit the road when you're talking about a specific ordinance. That's how it gets applied to the individual property owner. So during that period, I may be in the shoreland zoning ordinance, shoreland zoning because I may be 250 feet away, but there's no local ordinance. There's only this general statute. I can do anything I want. General statute is not applying to me because the general statute is not directed at me as a property owner. It is directed at me, or it's directed at my governing, my, my, the political body above me saying you've got to adopt something. Now as it happened, that's not, that's not what happened here. Cape Elizabeth created an ordinance, decided it did not like the, the model guidelines, which it is permitted to do. It created an ordinance, it sent it off to the DEP. The DEP reviewed it. And as I understand it, at the time, they were entitled, they, they only had two options. They could either accept it or reject it. Today, they can accept it, reject it, or accept it with conditions. The DEP reviewed the whole thing, and as I understand it, knew about the height issue, but decided that on balance, the whole thing satisfied the, the requirements under the minimum guidelines that were in existence at the time. Sent a letter approving it, which is what is, I mean, that's, that's exactly everything that's supposed to happen under the Modern Shoreland Act, Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act. And when that happens, it's done. That's the law that in Cape Elizabeth. That's what you look to. You don't look and try to mishmash. And that's the other thing. I mean, basically what they're asking you to do here is undertake a legislative action. They are asking this board to say, you know what? We really don't like the definition of height that Cape adopted. Repeal it. Enact something else that's more consistent with what we see the state guidelines as being. That's why they keep on talking about things other than the ordinance. They don't talk about the ordinance. They talk about the guidelines. They talk about the statute. They talk about everything but the ordinance, basically. Although I think their argument, and I'm not saying I agree with it, is that there is a generic definition at the beginning of our ordinance, and when you get to the specific section for shoreland zones, it's silent. So therefore, we pull in the, the definition from the MRSA. So uh, that, that argument <laughs> arises out of a failure to read many ordinances, if, in my opinion. There are many ordinances that do it exactly the same way, 
In fact, there are a lot of ordinances that do not have specific set out shoreland zoning definitions. They have generic definitions that go to the whole ordinance. And that's the way you read ordinances. If there's a definition section, that definition section always applies throughout the ordinance. You can't say, you know what, this definition section, I don't think it really should apply to the RA1 district. I don't think it should apply to the shoreland zone. That's not how you read an ordinance. An ordinance it has to be read as a whole. That's a fundamental tenet of, of statutory construction. You read it as a whole. You look at this, the, the, the definitions are at the beginning. You read them. They apply to everything that follows unless it says otherwise. And that's what it is. And it's the, de the definition of height is set out in your ordinance. We satisfy it. That's the end of the analysis. There's, it's not more complicated than that. Can we agree that to the extent the DEP was re-reviewing the town ordinance, it would have to look at our height requirement? And there would have to be an explanation for why we deviate from the standard that is currently in the MRSA. If we weren't changing, at least the, agree on if that. the town were not changing it, I don't think that they would actually. But, but if the town, oh, you're saying if the town was generically changing the shoreland uh, zone ordinance, but not specifically the height requirement, you think it would be left untouched by the DEP? I don't I realize recall, I'm asking you to. I, I don't expect. recall exactly how that process works, um, but I can tell you that that. Uh, uh, you know, the D, it, it, again, it, and again, it really doesn't matter for this appeal because, again, it's an issue for the DEP. And maybe they would have to, maybe if, even if they would, and I don't think that they would, but even if they would, that's a perspective that's going to affect anyone who applies after that ordinance change takes place. And uh, could you go a little bit more into the argument that basically if there's a deviation from a minimum standard, you need to have an explanation in order for that deviation to carry any effect? Well, again, that's an argument that, that you have to make to the DEP. You have to provide evidence to it. And, and the important point about that as well is that uh, I have yet to see any case and can't imagine an argument in which I'm a landowner. I say, you know what? You've deviated from some restriction that's in the model guidelines. And I don't think you provided adequate explanation to the DEP about it. So therefore, I'm not, I don't have to apply for it. It, doesn't, it does not apply to me because it's now invalid. Well, if we're going to, if you're going to, I mean, that's basically what the argument is. That's, that's totally what the argument is. Although that argument would never occur because the argument is that th this only applies when you go below a minimum standard. Well, but so it would have, it, 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 that's what the argument is from an abutter. What I'm saying, though, is that you don't take it up with this zoning board. You go take it up with the DEP. It's a jurisdictional issue at this I point. Think that's the, that's the, I think this is a lot simpler than what it's being made out to. I mean, we have an ordinance yes. that the DEP gave its blessing on, and what he is saying, which, you know, is if there's a problem with that, then you go to the DEP. They'll take action. Otherwise, you reinforce what they've... Or... You go to the DP or you file a lawsuit trying to invalidate that provision. Right. Because the court's the one, the only one that's going to have the power to do that. You do not. No, no offense, but he, the, the board mean, does not have jurisdiction. Uh, essentially, if we don't do that, what we're basically doing is we're overriding the DEP. I'm not sure we have the. Well, I think you're overriding. Council, I mean, you could, you could tell, tell us if we're starting to overstep our. our I think you're overriding I, the I town council, actually. So basically, the argument would be even if their argument has merit, we as a board would still need to find that our ordinance uh, controls, uh, despite the fact that, that no explanation was provided, and that argument would have to be brought to a court because of the fact that it's invalidating the ordinance for uh, improper administration. Well, I, I wouldn't characterize their argument as having merit. I'm not sure. But what isn't there a second Sorry, step there to. too? I mean, even assuming we were to come to the conclusion that somehow we ended up back in the 38 MRSA definitions, I don't see how we get there. But assuming we did, then we'd have to have evidence in the record that indicated that we exceeded those, exceeded that 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 definition led to us exceeding the, or this project exceeding the 35 foot height restriction. Which is a good point because that's the basis for the appeal and do we have any evidence that this even exceeds the height requirements under the, the, I'll call it the most restrictive potential definition of height? Well, but the, I, I think the other, the other point about that, 
the determination of whether this is more or less restrictive, I think ultimately, you know, whether the statute definition or the, is more or less restrictive than what the CAPE's definition is, that's a legislative determination. Uh, I mean, it's, it could also be a judicial determination or a determination by the DEP, but that's not really a determination that the, I mean, look at it this way. What, what is the code enforcement officer in this case supposed to have done under their argument? On their argument, the code enforcement officer is supposed to look at this, the ordinance, see a definition that says you measure height this way, and say, no, I am not going to apply the CAPE ordinance as written. Instead, I'm going to apply something else. No code enforcement officer would ever do that or should ever do that. The code enforcement officer is required to comply with the ordinance. The ordinance sets a standard. The standard is the, the, the mean average grade, which we meet. That it's really a simple, simple issue. All this other stuff is stuff, complaints about the CAPE ordinance generically. Complaints that the CAPE ordinance should be amended. Arguments that should really be going to town council saying we don't think our CAPE ordinance is fully compliant with what it should be under the Mandatory Shrewd and Zoning Act, so you should change it to make it more compliant. Or possibly to the DEP saying we want you to come and exercise your power under 14 MRSA Section 435 at SEC, and we want you to force this town to amend it to make it more restrictive. But what's happened here is the town has enacted an ordinance, has enacted it properly, in accordance, as far as we know, with all of the, the standards that apply for the town council, has enacted it completely in compliance with, with the mandatory shoreland zoning ordinance, so it applies. It is the standard, and it has set a height standard that we meet. There really isn't anything else to argue about, because all the other stuff is either legislative or standards that just simply do not apply to, to, home, to landowners. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Foley, have, uh, just step to the mic, please. Okay. I do have some more uh, input on that for you. Um, the uh, building height, the vertical distance from the average original grade to the top of the highest roof beams of a flat roof or the mean level of the highest gable or slope of a hip roof. This building <clears throat> has a bit of a hip roof and then roofs that are not hip. In the applicant's presentation, this is the roof. Is that a bird's eye view? So the top is flat? Okay. Um, and in fact, when you look at the side profile on our board here, where the uh, house itself shows on the slope, you can see that this is not, in fact, a hip roof. There's parts of it that are hip, but the majority of it, I'm sorry, the majority of it is uh, just a regular roof line. So this definition, if you think technical about it, really only applies to flat roofs and hip roofs. And this is not. It's something else. So then the height would be strictly 35 feet, measured from where the building is to the top. And again, you have to decide where you measure. So if you Elizabeth, specific about how to measure irrespective of what kind of roof it is. Thank you. Sure, of course. Hi, I'm Russ Doucette, the builder and the designer of the home. Uh, 
I've been building in the Cape Elizabeth area for since 1980. And as far as I know, as far as I go back, the mean of the roof in Cape Elizabeth has always been midpoint of the roof, which the definition means that. And that's how Bruce used to do it. I have built homes from Cape Elizabeth to Freeport, and every municipality has done the same thing. Okay, it's always been to the mean of the roof. There are some municipalities that go to the peak of the roof. In this case, Cape Elizabeth's ordinance is the midpoint of the roof. It makes no difference if it's a flat roof or a hip roof, etc. It always has been that way. As far as the gentleman saying that once the Leopolds were interested in purchasing this home, that we didn't do our due diligence as far as inquiring about what we can do and what we can't do is totally false. Um, when the Leopolds came to me and asked if I was interested in helping them out building a home, I said yes. At that point, knowing the home, I did come to Cape Elizabeth and talk to the building inspector, found out what I could and couldn't do. And he explained to me everything that I needed to do. Once the Leopolds did decide to purchase the lot, we did do our due diligence. We did hire Sebago Tech Neeks to give us our guidelines, our setbacks, our height limits, our average heights, etc. So we did do our due diligence. We did nothing wrong where the, the, the Leopolds were very much in favor of doing everything they could so they would not get any roadblocks going forward. Obviously, we got a roadblock. Uh, as far as uh, the average grade, the average grade is taken and it explains, I believe in your packages, that it, it starts from the right-hand side of the garage uh, at the highest point of the garage, which is ground level, and it goes all around the building, and it takes an average grade. Once that average grade is taken, and I believe it was like eight, eight feet, that eight feet is subtracted from the 35 feet, which is a height limit, which gives me, what, 35 feet? Uh, no, 37 feet of height that I can go to the mean of the roof. That's how Cape Elizabeth, Freeport, Kenny Bunkport, they've all done it that way. And that's what I was told to do. There's a couple of houses that I have built in Cape Elizabeth on shoreland zoning. We've done it that way all along. We've never had a problem. Uh, one of them is right in Broad Cove, which is right next door. We never had a problem. So we did do our due diligence. We did it the right way. I was told to do it this way, and I got my permit. Is it? Just, like it's it's not, a, um, can we just finish? Yeah, we just going to finish his presentation, and we'll see. Do you, Mr. Foley? Is, is, is it a flat roof anywhere on this building? No. Or, no. There, is a, there is a small flat roof over the garage that's about a foot wide by about 20 feet long. But the rest of it is sloped. It's a, it's a gambrel and a, a gable roof, and it does have a hip roof on it as well. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So when I designed the house, I needed to know the rules and regulations. I needed to know the height limits so I didn't exceed those things. Last thing I wanted to do was to build a house that was higher than what it needed to be. I didn't want to tear it down. So we followed the rules and regulation that were brought forth to me. And unfortunately, I think the issue we've had with a number of appeals over the last month or two is whether right or wrong, some, some people have argued that the, the former town's um, CEO was offering incorrect advice, although I'd note that we have yet to overturn any of his decisions. But um, that, that's what's at issue here. We, we're not, there hasn't, as far as I'm aware, been an argument that you were purposely attempting to violate the... If I can point out to that ordinance. point... The, uh, the building, of per building permit in this, this that's being under appeal at this time was not a product of the prior code enforcement officer, but was signed by the, uh, I believe it's the interim code enforcement officer. Fair enough. All right.
measurements and according to this distance and so forth, apply them to the plan, we don't get here. And it, we ran out with no measurements on this side of the building. So first of all, this data is short. Um, and you can see each of the references where we said that A, B, C, so on and so forth. And that's we run out here of data. So um, I'm not sure how it's calculated the average grade, but that's incomplete data, first of all. Second of all, um, he's already admitted just a minute ago that this is only partially, partially a hip loop. It's cable, gambra, and a bunch of combinations of different loops. So you have to decide which loop are we applying to and how does it Although the, the problem with that argument is basically, in effect, you're saying that the height building definition in our ordinance only contemplates two roof types and is silent as to another roof type. And perhaps. And remember, you, this is, if you look at the thing, it says that that's the actual definition of the building. Our ordinance tends to be a little sloppy in a number of areas, but my understanding of what was intended here is they were just trying to convey that with a flat roof, it's the flat roof, but otherwise for other types of roofs, it's basically the midpoint. But, but it doesn't say that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's just this, this argument, at least for me, maybe the rest of the board disagrees with me, just doesn't carry much water to say that it's silent as to any type of roof other than a flat or a gable or, uh, or slope of a hip roof. Deborah Murphy again. Um, I think that the BOCA standard was set up because flat roofs and hip roofs traditionally have a s smaller slope. And so it was to allow some room with those roof types. So it is restrictive to those two roof types, just to state that. The other but then, thing otherwise, that, there's no definition of a building height anywhere in our ordinance for any of the other sections. Yeah, there is. There's maximum height of 35 feet. But how do we calculate the maximum height of a building? Because if you're in that's the shoreland performance, our ordinance, if you want to play the game of it's silent, it doesn't say that in the ordinance. Right. Yeah. When you look in the definition section, it said words that are not defined herein take their literal meaning. So then, when you go to the shoreland performance overlay district. 19611A, and it says that this district is in accordance with Title 38. Okay, Mr. Phil, I mean, one at a time. I need yeah. you guys to mow. And the Title mic. 38, MSRA 436A7A, gives you the specifics. So it's, it's hard to understand, because I can see how the DEP looking at this would look at when they, when they looked at it, and by the way, I think CAPE's ordinance was amended in 2009, and if I understand right, when an amendment is done, the DEP looks at the ordinance to see if it's in compliance, right? So in 2009, they took a look at it, and the way I think that a reasonable person can look at it is, yeah, that height building, definition, the definition section, does apply in CAPE Elizabeth, but in the Shoreland Performance Overlay District, it doesn't because that district is in accordance with Title 38, which directs you to Definition 7A in that statute. But there's nothing which, in our ordinance that says, in interpreting this section, look to the MRSA for your it definitions. It does. It says, it's, it was, it says that it was adopted in accordance with... No, Established in accordance with... But it doesn't say, and the definitions in that section are controlling over what is found in this ordinance. And the definitions themselves say these definitions apply when interpreting this part of the statute, <laughs> not in interpreting ordinances adopted pursuant to the statute. And that's, I guess, the biggest hurdle you have to get over <clears throat> to me, at least. And I don't Why would the statute have a methodology if they, they didn't want you to apply it? I mean, it says... <laughs> Where reference is made to town or state laws, ordinances, or regulations, each reference to a particular law, regulation, or section shall include all amendments and successive sections. And then in 1910-1, any conflicts <coughs> within the ordinance, the more restrictive applies. It's, it's just hard to get to not, to not understand that. I mean, I, I don't see how 7A does not apply. 
apply. Maine is a home rule state. state. When you're looking at what applies locally, you look at your local ordinances. And in the ordinance. <laughs> but the, if the DEP were looking at our ordinance and they looked Which at 19611 a and they see that it was established in accordance with and they looked at it again in 2009 when an amendment was done. And, and every again, every single ordinance, every single shoreland ordinance in the state of Maine was created in accord with 38 MRSA et cetera. Yet yeah, people either, municipalities could either adopt, the, allow the state and use the state's ordinance or they could write their own, correct? Right. And add to their existing ordinance. So that definition was in the existing ordinance. No. Yes, it, it was. It was in the statute. Height building? It's in the statute. In, in, in CAPE's ordinance, the height building definition has been there since the ordinance yes, was that created. that's in our ordinance. Okay. So then the Shoreland Overlay Performance District was added after mm -hmm. with the sentence in the purpose saying in accordance with and with information pertaining to the 35 feet like anywhere else in the world. We can agree the town does not administer the MRSA. <laughs> no, but they ought to comply by it, right? <laughs> the so. <laughs> problem with 1910.1 is the conflicts provision only applies for ordinances, regulations, or statutes administered by the town. But if it's within your ordinance and it's cited within your ordinance, why would it be cited if you weren't supposed to pay attention to it? They basically, we have this flowery preamble language that says, we've adopted this in, in uh, accordance with basically the MRSA that says that we're supposed to adopt a shoreland performance zone. And that's what that preamble language at least means to me that you're pointing to. Okay. But I will say, too, just on that, that, is, that definition is restricted to flat roofs and hip roofs. If you look at the BOCA standard, it is. And it's worded that way. So if you don't have... An entire hip roof, I think you have a problem. Thank you, Mrs. Murphy. Yeah. Uh, is there any other public comment before we? Uh... <coughs> Maynard Murphy, 24 Pilot Point Road. The maximum height of a building in Cape Elizabeth's ordinance is 35 feet, and it's measured from the downslope side of a structure inside the shoreland zone and outside of the shoreland zone it's measured from average grade around the structure that's in the ordinance and references that's all i have <clears throat> good evening i'm jay chatness i live at five wayman road i'd like to point out a couple of things if i may uh referring to the zoning ordinance for the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, the latest version, the December 14, 2012, is what I'm referring to. <clears throat> I, I consider the definition section of the ordinance probably one of the most important sections of, of an ordinance because it sets the guiding standards for the whole rest of the ordinance. Uh, let me read the first sentence of building height, page 8. Of, of the current version, height, comma, building. <clears throat> and again, this is in the definition section. The vertical distance from the average original grade to the top of the highest roof beams of a flat roof, it's one type of roof, or to the mean level of the highest gable, second type of roof, or sl the slope of a hip roof, third type of roof. So. Building height clearly addresses three different types of roofs. Uh, flat, gable, and in the event that it, there's no gable, it's a hip roof, typical. And the key word to this is the mean level of the highest gable, or the mean level of the slope of the hip roof. Uh, I served on the zoning board for a number of years, so I'm quite familiar with, with how our town interpreted this. Uh, the, the mean level being from uh, if you're talking about a gable uh, uh, sloped roof with a gable, from the ridge, roof ridge, to the lowest point of, of the roof, which is in the fascia board soffit area, uh, the midpoint is what we determine, define the mean level, the mean height, the midpoint. And 
<clears throat> another way to look at that is the shingled area from the highest shingled area at the roof ridge to the lowest shingled area. You take the midpoint. That's how we determine building height. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, uh, the definition section goes on to address if it's on the intersection of two streets and if other things that I won't uh, go into. Uh, and again, I want to mention that the first part of that also addresses the average original grade to the top of the highest roof beam or the mean level of the highest gable or slope of the hip roof. So you're taking the average of the original average grade, the average of that, and the mean point or the midpoint of the slope roof. Uh, in the Shoreland Performance Overlay District, section 19.6.11, E2, Space and Bulk Standards, uh, page 138, under the section titled Maximum Building Height, uh, one, principal and accessory structures and expansion of existing structure, that maximum height is 35 feet. There's one definition of building height in the Cape Ordinance. There's not a definition for this section, this district. There's not a definition for a different district in town. There's one definition. A building height is a building height. In the Shoreland Performance Overlay District, which the subject property is, the building height is 35 feet, and that's been well established. And, and lastly, I would like to ref <clears throat> refer to a email correspondence that was apparently generated by uh, Barbara Freeman, who lives on Pilot Point Road. It was addressed to Michael J. Morse, the main DEP. I uh, would assume that you all may have a copy of this. Uh, and apparently Ms. Freeman queried, sent the specifics of construction to the main DEP and asked for their comments on it. Michael Morse of the Maine DEP on November 26, five weeks ago, uh, I'm not going to read the whole email correspondence, but I'd like to read the first paragraph in, in, in another section. Uh, Michael Morse of the Maine DEP wrote, Dear Ms. Freeman, thank you for seeking our opinion regarding structure height within the shoreland zone in Cape Elizabeth. I have reviewed the department's records, and it appears that the department approved the town of Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance definition for, quote, building height at least as far back as July 17, 1992. We recognize that the definition deviates from the state minimum shoreland zoning requirements. However, since we approved the town's ordinance definition, the local ordinance is legally effective and controls. The state's minimum shoreland zoning requirements do not apply locally when a municipality has an ordinance that has been approved by the department. Uh, the second paragraph goes a little bit into the history. I'll read a couple of sentences from the third paragraph. Considering the current state shoreland zoning definition, quote, height of a structure, Within our chapter 1000, which has been referenced tonight, within our chapter 1000 guidelines, along with the suggested 44.8 foot structure height, I assume that's of the proposed Leopold uh, development. Uh, let me read that again. Within, considering the current state shoreland zoning definition, quote, height of a structure within our chapter 1000 guidelines, along with the suggested 44.8 foot structure height for the project you discussed below, it seems clear that the town's ordinance method for determining structure height in the shoreland zone is less restrictive than the state's. As discussed, uh, uh, the state's uh, assumed uh, requirement. As discussed above, the town must apply its legally effective and locally adopted ordinance since it has been approved by the department. This is a direct statement five weeks ago from the Maine DEP, and in my opinion, it renders this whole appeal moot. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? 
Yep, someone coming in behind you. Hi, I'm Kim Cripps at 10 Pilot Point. I just wanted to say in a more general aspect about in keeping with the neighborhood, I sat through earlier where you discussed a double car garage versus a single car garage. And I'm asking about the houses that are on Pilot Point Road. I think everyone should have photographs of the houses that are on Pilot Point and see if the houses that are being done now are in keeping with the neighborhood. Uh, it's real simple. People that used to have views of the water don't have views anymore because houses went up uh, more than they should have. And I feel it's just a simple aspect of that is looking at the quality of the neighborhood, what people liked about it, but then they want to change everything, and that changes the neighborhood. That's it. Thank you. Again, you're responding. You asked me to come up with this. Uh, I, I do believe that the building is too high. Um, and one of the things that, aside from the fact that we don't have a roof that complies, if you apply it without looking at that, it says to the highest gable or slope of the hip roof. Well, the highest one is the 10 pitch. On the, on the left side of the structures, you face it from the street. And it's not a lot to it. This little triangle here, the mean of that, is going to be maybe a foot below the top of the building. And that does, in fact, live over 35 feet. Under the, under your, under the CAPE standard? The CAPE standard at the front of the ordinance instead of the one that's from the road. Is that this one with, that's over the garage? Is that the one over the garage or over the windows? I think it's over the windows on the left, based on the. Is it this or this? It is. Let's see, that's the first. So, there's some legs up in here. There's a roof that's higher in here than this? No, this is the top. This is the top. When you look at the way the roof lays out, if you put this as a bird's eye view on there, this isn't touching there, this sticks out. Okay? So there's a lot of, of stuff so he's seen here. He's seen that's higher than this? Somehow the roof. This is 27, 27 pieces. But he's pointing to the highest gears. So he's saying that there's an additional one up here. No matter how you look at this, it. This probably needs to be up there. That's an effect. Could we take this one? Could you take this to the microphone? Could we take Could we take this to the microphone? So how is how is a part of the roof that's not the ridge line higher than the ridge line? That's what I'm struggling with. Can, can, Mr. Foley, you got to get to the microphone. Nope. <coughs> this one that I'm pointing to, if that you look at the time. 23 feet, yeah. it's the shorter of those two measures. Okay? It's to the midpoint of this roof here. But all of these numbers are less than 35. Correct. But they're measuring from the street level. And if you read the, the thing, it says the vertical distance from the average original grade, which is nine and a half feet more, than shown on the plan. I thought he said something other than nine and a half. If you look, well, when you, when you take his measurements, where's my board? When you take his Do you have any measurements that show that that's actually higher than this? 
When you take his measurement for slope, and you take the high one and the low one, in between is 18 feet. What did we come up with? It's almost 19 feet. So it's nine and a half feet, at least, is the average of his slope. What he's given you is the height from here up. You have to take the average of the slope, which is somewhere in here, and go up to some point of the roof, yet to be determined. And according to this, it says... What are you looking at? Sorry. Again, height that building in the beginning of your ordinance. Oh, right. The definition. Yep. Okay. It says the vertical distance from the average original grade, which is between here and there, the average, which is an additional nine and a half feet, to the top of the highest roof beams of a flat roof, doesn't apply, or to the mean level of the highest gable or slope of a hip roof. So, so maybe I've been misunderstanding this section of the ordinance, but my understanding is that when measuring the height of the building, especially when you look at the second sentence when talking about when it abuts more than two streets, it's the height is measured from the average of the original grade on the side facing the street. No, it doesn't say that. So you, you, we, we can agree that when it faces more than one street, it talks about measuring the height from the average of the original grades at the center of the face of the building fronting on each street. So you have to do it from both sides when it touches. We have two streets. One is paper here. One is in place. Well, the town has to prepare <laughs> and plan down. as if I, they were developed. I guess what I'm struggling with is that we have technical plans by registered engineers mm -hmm. that show me numbers that are in compliance with the ordinance. And then I have kind of... I'm using their numbers. And but I'm not. not necessarily understanding what you're looking at or where that is. Okay. So. Well, I, it's hard for me to do it <coughs> from over here to you, but if you look at height building, it says the vertical distance from the average original grade, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the grade, and I'll come back to the mic in a minute. Look at the grade. And is the grade that you're looking at on the Sebago Technics chart? This okay. is presented by Leopold's yep. by Rusty Sedge. And you look at the grade, mm -hmm. and you take the average that's here. Well, the average that I would use would be from the Sebago Technics information. Yeah. And you take that. Okay. The average grade. Oh, sorry. I hear you. Mm. Mm -hmm. So if you use an average elevation of 54.89, okay. where, where on the building is it over 35 feet? This is a little And I, I still think that is, is utterly irrelevant for height under our ordinance. When I look at height under our ordinance, and this is the way I've been approaching it, it's all about the height as measured from the street side. Where does it say that? Looking right at the ordinance. That's my def I'm looking at how, how it applies, the calculation. And it talks about if you're facing more than one street, you have to measure from both perspectives, from both of the streets, which implies when you're only facing one street, you only measure from the street. And when we don't turn, apply. Determining the average grade. Remember, we so can't. Therefore, I look at the average grade from the street level, and I look at this and I say the average grade here, assuming, let's say we're starting at a zero here, would be at most 27 feet under their argument of which height rule applies. So if you have... On, laid out in your town streets, some of which are not yet built. Does that mean that before those streets are built, it's okay to violate the zoning on the street side so that when the street is finally built, you then have houses that are in nonconformance because you didn't? I mean, the purpose of laying out a street in advance is so people know that the setbacks apply from a street, from a street. <laughs> And when you, when you get done with the development of those streets, everybody's in compliance. That's why you lay them out ahead of time, so that nobody's sitting right on top of a street or you know, creating setback issues. 
Okay. So here we have a street on both sides, okay, and one not yet developed, but still accepted by the town as the proposed street. And you must plan for that eventual development of that street. Accordingly, you have to measure from both streets, which gives you the average grade front to back, which adds nine and a half feet to the height. The problem is street as defined in our ordinance is a public or private right of a uh, private way or road other than a private access way as in here and defined. Having a defined travel way with a paved gravel or exposed mineral soil surface that is used on a regular basis to provide vehicular access. And we don't have one of those right now. We have a paper street at most and there's a dispute as to whether there's even a paper street. So well, it's not a dispute is there a paper street. The streets, the paper street's there, but the question is, to take this all back, though, to does the it go have to be graveled and all that? Is calculating the height, from my perspective, it's from the street side. You measure the average grade on the street side. And I, I don't see the 35. OK. Um, I, I'd like to, I, I, think, I think we've gotten uh, uh, both sides' uh, perspective uh, pretty thoroughly. I'd like to close the public comment at this stage. I just closed the public uh, portion of the hearing. He's, he's already in line, but do you have? Do you need a copy of this for your records, or I don't know if, because don't think... that's the actual roof line, and that would be the highest. Yeah, right. Yep. It's with the permit. <clears throat> What he's pointing to has been submitted as part of the, pub, the permit, so I believe it's part of the record already. Okay. Uh, average grade around a structure in the shoreland zone is irrelevant to the height of the structure because it's measured from the downhill side of the structure as per Section 19611A, which says the district is established in accordance with the provisions of 38 MRSA. 435 at seek. That is references so that it doesn't have to print the whole thing. You, you have to abide by it. You can't be less restrictive than the state law. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. You're welcome. So close the public portion uh, of the hearing. Thank you, everybody, for your input and comments. my perspective at least to the extent that the, uh, the definition as explicitly laid out in the Cape Ordinance for height applies from my perspective there's not a violation so it's all about which um, which definition applies I'm ready to move that we dismiss the appeal uh, I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to move that we dismiss the appeal can you lay out your reasoning for the appellants so that they understand why you would say that the appeal should be dismissed? I can. The height definition that is in the ordinance is the methodology and the definition that applies in the town of Cape Elizabeth. There's no evidence in the record that is substantial that supports the conclusion that that height limit of 35 feet was exceeded. Anybody else want to comment? And can you provide your reasoning as to why the state uh, statute or the DEP regulation does not trump the town ordinance? Maine is a home rule state in which ordinances apply where they have been asked to be enacted by state statute. There, it's not so much a question of trumping as it is enactment of the legislation required that DEP put in place model ordinance language to go out to the towns. The towns were then to submit their ordinances for DEP approval. That's exactly what happened here. The town of Cape Elizabeth submitted their ordinance. It was approved by DEP. DEP reviewed these exact circumstances back in November and said, look, you need to apply your ordinance. That's what we need to do. And an additional point there that was made 
I'm not sure by whom, is that what any code enforcement officer would do and would be required to do is to look to our ordinance to determine what regulations apply and could not be expected and should not look beyond those ordinances and apply some other standard outside the ordinances. If I might, for the drafting of the minutes, I, uh, there was a motion to dismiss the appeal, and the findings of fact would be the first three that were in the draft findings of fact. A fourth one, the height definition in the ordinance is the methodology that needs to be applied in this instance as Maine as a home rule state, and the town shoreland zoning provisions were approved by the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. And the next point, there is no evidence in the record that the height limit is exceeded. That's what I have so far. Once you finish writing it, you can give it to me. Now. Yeah, I think you lost me on that. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, you're going to have it all. I'm so just drafting what I'm hearing. Okay, as a proposed uh, findings of fact for just us. Working right. on it, yeah. Right. Work in progress. Ad additional finding of facts. Um, anybody else have anything to say on? Uh, I'll just provide my reasoning, which is very similar to Joanna's, on why I believe the ordinance definition applies and the MRS does not apply in this instance. So uh, the MRS definitions, from my perspective, as uh, the appellee's attorney had noted, they're definitions that apply in interpreting the MRS statute. This is technically an ordinance separate from the MRS statute, adopted in accordance with the statute, but those definitions in the statute itself says that these definitions apply as used in this chapter, as used in that chapter, not as used in ordinances adopted pursuant to this chapter. And because of that, I don't see the MRS as in any way governing as opposed to our town ordinance that was adopted in accordance with the chapter. As for the DEP regulations, to the extent that the DEP has said, oh, in calculating height, here's what you're supposed to do, I think the fact that we as a town put forward an ordinance to the DEP and the DEP approved it does carry some weight. I think to the extent that we were to, if we were to put this ordinance to the D DEP again, I think that it would be perfectly valid for the comment to be lodged with the DEP that, hey, look at this height requirement. This height requirement does not meet the minimum standards you've laid out. CAPE needs to provide a justification for why we're deviating. But at, it doesn't affect this appeal, but I think it is important to note the fact that the DEP has told us, hey, as part of our four years or whatever the time period is, and a uh, semi-annual review of this, this section of the statute, we are already considering changing how we calculate height, and we're considering changing it in a way that's basically in compliance with the CAPE calculation of height. So basically, we've had the DEP tell us, you know, height, we, we think it actually should be calculated from the high grade. It, we, we have that in the record so that we, in effect, have the DEP saying, you know, this is in keeping with the spirit of the statute anyway. So I look at all of that, take it all in conjunction, uh, take, taking it all into account, I think the, the height calculation as uh, detailed in our town ordinance is one that applies. And, and we also have the letter. I mean, this is part of the record, and it's the, it's a November 26, 2002 email from Michael Morse, who is the, 2012, sorry, uh, who is the <coughs> Assistant Shoreland Zoning Coordinator of the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. And I mean, this email, it's a, it's a very detailed email. It has very good reasoning and it basically directs the town to apply its legally effective and locally adopted ordinance. And, and that's what I think we're talking about doing, so. I, I, I guess I, I take a, a very simplistic view, which is we have a definition for what our height, height of buildings is in the ordinance. Um, we have a height restriction in our, in our shoreland Ordinances as well at 35 feet, and you couple that with, you know, uh, Mr. Morris and the DEP, basically, you know, indicating that our that our ordinances are, are what are to be relied upon since we went to the DEP in the first place to get their approval for it. Um, so, from my perspective, um, you know, the the appeal, um, I'm not going to vote in support of the appeal. 
barrier? I go along, I go along with that thinking. Um, I also agree with you. Uh, my only other two points is that uh, I don't read the uh, two provisions in the ordinance uh, as the appellants do. I think there is a forced concept of an ambiguity that does not exist. And I think that the appeal should be dismissed. Sure, I, I agree with my fellow members of the board. I believe that there was a, a forced attempt to read certain words into two provisions of the ordinance. Um, we did not use the word ambiguity, but in legal terms, it's, it's significant, and those issues were not addressed. When we read a particular paragraph, um, the, the sentence suggests it's merely a town ordinance and town statute is not defined in any special terms. And the other provision talks about in accordance. And what we're talking about there is a general following, not exact representation or compliance. Hence, I follow my members. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so are we ready to? Uh... Joanna made a motion, but I never oh. heard a second. I'll, I'll second the motion. Forgot it. Forgot it first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Josh seconded. <coughs> So, uh, I guess all in favor of uh, uh, dismissing the administrative appeal um, for uh, building permit 130152 um, is issued to David and Kara Leopold for property they own at map U12, lot 71 at 25 Bullet Point Road. Pallet Point Road, sorry. Uh, all in favor of dismissal? Against? No, you no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 I get passed unanimously at 7 0. Uh, yeah, we need to do the, the finding of facts as well. Um, uh, so, uh, the matter before the board, administrative appeal for map U12, lot 71, permit number 130152, 25 Pilot Point Road. Appellants, George W. Foley III, Suzanne R. Lindsay, Della Hitchcock, Betsy French, Gerald French, Stephen Sutton, and Kimberly Cripps. Uh, additional finding of facts. On November 1st, 2012, building permit 130152 is issued to David and Cara Leopold for property they own at map U12, lot 71 at 25 Pilot Point Road to remove the roof and all first floor walls to add a second floor and build all new walls. All in favor? Although we didn't discuss any of that detail, is, it anyone, is anyone opposed to just saying that the permit was issued? We took no findings of fact as to all those details. It's all on the record, though. I think it was application itself. I was going to say, I, it's I, in the I app. Oh, yeah, there's, there's written record as opposed yeah. to just verbal or oral record. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, all in favor? Against? Okay, 7 0. The property is in the RA district and being within 250 feet horizontal distance. <laughs> of the Atlantic Ocean is also in the Shoreland Performance Overlay District. All in favor? Opposed? 7-0. On November 30, 2012, appellants George W. Foley, Suzanne R. Lindsay, Della Hitchcock, Betsy French, Gerald French, Su uh, Steve Sutton, and Kimberly Cripps filed an administrative appeal asking for the Zoning Board of Appeals to review the decision of the Code Enforcement Officer in issuing permit number 130152. All in favor? Opposed? 7-0. Well, give me that. Would you want me to read? No. You feel free. Yeah. The, uh, the height definition in the ordinance is the methodology that needs to be applied in this instance as Maine as a home rule state, and the town shoreland provisions were approved by the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. All in favor? Opposed? 7 zero. And the height definition, uh, no, I'm sorry. There is no evidence in the record that the height limit in the ordinance was exceeded. All in favor? Opposed? That's all I got. I heard more discussion by the mayor. Anything proposed for the addition? Was 
anybody think there's anything glaring, glaringly missing from this? Okay. So I think that uh, takes care of the administrative appeals. Is there any other communications before the zoning board this evening? Well, with that, we will adjourn at 9.42 p.m. Thank you. Everybody have a good evening.